The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. covering subjects that will open up your mind and provide you with information you may have never heard before. Now on today's show, I'm about to be joined by my guest, Jason Gregory. Now Jason is a teacher and international speaker, specializing in Eastern and Western philosophy, comparative religion, metaphysics, and ancient cultures. Now he's the author of the book, Science and the Practice of Humility. Now he divides his time between Asia and Australia, Jason Gregory, welcome to the show. That's great to be on, Kevin. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. All the way from Thailand. Yeah, all the way in uh, up in Chiang Mai, northern Thailand there. So a beautiful part of the world. Well, how did you end up there? I mean, I know you, you'd traveled to India before. I know that bit about yourself and that in your travels and that much. But uh, yeah, I mean, why Asia? Well, I, I actually left I left Australia back in 2008 and I tra started traveling with my wife and um, to further my research in Eastern philosophy. And we traveled for a, a few years and then we went back to Australia for a couple. And then we came back and since 2012, I've been living in Asia, um, usually between uh, India, Nepal and, and Thailand, but mainly, mainly Thailand. Um, I, I must admit, because there are some creature comforts here. In Thailand, but um, I, I I I would prefer to live in a place like India if I could find a um, you know a nice ha a nice home. And there are plenty of areas I'd like to live in India. But um, yeah, the reason I chose Thailand is because it keeps me close to India and and also Eastern Asia. My wife's from uh, Korea, so you know it's a good sort of location. And um, yeah, that's basically it. Wow, what was life like living in India? Uh, life in India is it, it can be interesting. I mean, it can be one of the most chaotic places you've ever been to, but at the same time, one of the most peaceful. You know, um, two of the my favorite places in the world is Tiruvannamalai in the south. Um, that's the the home of Ramana Maharishi. For those who are, are familiar with that 20th century sage, and um, Bodh Gaya in the north is another, another place I visit quite often, which is the um, the place where the historical Buddha attained enlightenment under the, the famous Bodhi tree there. So, um, it, yeah, life in India is great. I mean, you just have to keep your wits about you and don't believe everything you read in the newspaper because the people are, are wonderful when you get into especially the rural areas of India, when you get outside of Delhi and Calcutta and these places. So, yeah, definitely if anyone listening wants to travel India, I say go for it. Wow. Yeah, I, I've kind of been drawn to go there, but America seems to be where I'm heading to right now. But uh, yeah, and, and it's not so expensive to live out there, isn't it, in India, I don't think? No, no, it's not expensive. You can live on basically, um, I would say, f with including rent and food, I would say anywhere between 400 US to 600 US a month. So, wow. Um, and if, and if, and if you want to even get less than that, you could probably uh, go, go yogi style and you could decrease that price. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Food for thought for definitely. Because um, I think people who get into this arena sometimes do fill a pool to India. Um, that's probably why I'm mentioning it. Probably why. Yeah. Um, oh, definitely you should go, Kev. Yeah. Well, what, <laughs> who knows, man? Who knows? <laughs> who knows? Um, so, um, enlightenment now. I almost want to say to you, well, what is it about? What makes it different from any other book out there? So I've kind of said it. What makes it different from any other book? That's a good question. Um, there are, as you know, plenty of books on enlightenment. Mine uh, explores a lot of the traditional philosophies um, in regards to enlightenment and also um, our modern perspective of it and what we think about it. And I kind of, I, I try to, you know, stop the bull you know, cut the bullshit, so to speak, with this book. And, um, you know, I, I take it from a purely uh, Eastern perspective. Like in Eastern thought, you know, there are varying schools, but in general, most of the Eastern schools of thought 
have this belief that enlightenment is something innate to our, to our own nature. It's something that is beneath our persona system, our personality. We have it when we can access it um, basically anytime we want. Um, but we, we can't think of that in a, in a, in a sort of Hollywood fashion. You know, enlightenment in the West has kind of got this, it has been depicted in kind of this Hollywood event or film that we're going to um, experience. And in the East, it's, it's much more simple than that. Um, you know, especially when we look at um, schools of Eastern thought like uh, Zen Buddhism, Vedanta, classical yoga, Theravada Buddhism, these sort of schools of thought, even Taoism have this idea. And so to, to come back to your, to your, to your question, uh, why it's different is, is everything that I've said, but also because I'm explaining it in, in the general sense that enlightenment is, is actually – not something that we need to strive to attain, but something that we already have. And I go through all of those systems of thought and also our modern perspective and also that, um, how psychology looks at this idea. So, yeah. That's really, really interesting. What a combination there. And I like that you say, you, you know, you cut the bullshit. That's good. That's good. I th you know, just get straight to it in a sense. Um, because, you know, I think there's different teachings for different people. And sometimes um, it can be rather complicated to the person who it's not resonating on the same level with. But when you meet that person which resonates on the same level as you, you're almost meeting someone on the same soul level. Um, and that's why it fits. And then once you've got to that level, maybe you will go up a level and then it's someone else's teachings that, that will take you further. But we're all where we're supposed to be. Um, when did you, why did you need to find enlightenment, do you think? <laughs> well, for me, I wouldn't say I'm enlightened, but um, uh, what what interests me, I don't know, it, was, it's, it goes to what you were just saying then, Kevin, like um, people have a different attraction and pull to certain things in, their, in life, you know, it might not be anything to do with philosophy or life in general, they might be attracted to filmmaking or something like this, um, but I was naturally drawn to Eastern thought, there was just things in it that were completely different from where I am from in Australia, um, and I, I never came from a background that was religious or spiritual in any way. Um, but once I traveled and, and I met my wife and, and started to visit the monasteries, the temples, the ashrams and all of that through Asia, um, I was just naturally drawn to uh, the practices of meditation, the script, scriptures, um, and even just people in general who write about these topics. And I, you know, I engrossed myself in, in that environment. And, and that's basically why I'm still in Asia now, because for me, that's my bread and butter. That's what I, I, I love to do and I love to explore. And, you know, other people, it'll be something different. But going back to what you just said before, you know, it is important that, you know, we do resonate with certain things uh, differently as well. So, you know, someone might, for example, come to Thailand and, um, come in contact with Theravada Buddhism, but they might not feel it at all. You know, it might be one of those things, but they might come across Mahayana Buddhism in India and, and they might feel that. You know, it, it's it's uh, horses for courses, but it's, you know, there are, you know, the, for me personally, I, I've just been attracted to the whole, the whole, every every kind of school in Eastern thought, and that's why I've studied them at length and, and why I write books about them, you know, in, in, uh, in relation also to psychology. Of course. And, you know, you would call this your purpose then, in a sense. This is what you feel fulfilled to do. Yeah, definitely. This is what I, this is what I feel is, um, makes me feel alive, you know, yeah. um, as, Joseph Cam as Joseph Campbell would say. So I, I would say, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, it's my purpose. And I, and I get a lot of um, joy out of teaching and, and writing books and, and, and discussing discussing it with people like yourself. Of course. So, so if people wanted to know more about yourself, so, you know, where, where you've got a website? Yeah, I've got a website. It's uh, jasongregory.org. So simply my name.org. And, you know, I've got, um, I've got a YouTube channel. It's at youtube.com slash one world within. And I've actually got a, a series of videos on there called enlightenment today, um, which I, 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 upload videos every now and again on that series there's about 19 episodes on there so if anyone wants to have a look there's a lot of information there on eastern thought excellent excellent okay um well we're linking all that on the screen right now so your website's coming up on the screen and also uh in the description we'll put uh, your youtube channel and uh, all your information um 
Okay, w what does enlightenment make you feel like, would you say? What's the feeling of enlightenment? Is it, because if you were to ask myself what is enlightenment, maybe for me my answer would be it's, it's to know that you're a soul having a human experience. What is your version of enlightenment? Well, that's a good, that's a good interpretation, Kevin. It's, and and um, mine would not be that much different, but... Um, Taking it from from the work that I've done in Eastern philosophy, it's um, basically when we talk about the feeling of enlightenment. First, we've got to kind of describe what enlightenment is, or what the the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Taoists would say enlightenment is, and and they would say it's it's a level of uh, consciousness beneath um, our surface personality. So you know, Kevin and Jason, as as these guys doing their thing in life and there's this there's this deeper reality um this deep down reality that um we come into contact with is which is part of the entire universe as as itself like it's the same within you and i this is the idea in the east and then there's concepts in the east like atman which is um undifferentiated consciousness that's a sanskrit word which translates as undifferentiated consciousness so that's beneath the Beneath Kevin, beneath Jason, as the as the personality and all of that surface material on our mind. So, enlightenment basically is to, and from their perspective, is to get back to that state. And Atman is used in in Vedanta, and there's words in Buddhism like Tathata, and and you have these experience this experience of Nirvana. So Nirvana is basically um, when the connection between you and the world has kind of dissolved. The 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 subject object split ha has disappeared, and you have this this state of consciousness which is expansive. Um, I don't want to say that you begin to feel that, you know, uh, people do have these experiences where they begin to feel that you you are part of everything, and I think that that can be part of the experience. But from my research and from my own personal experiences, that it's more of a, a sense of unity that you feel within all life. It's not so much that um, you start to, I start to see this computer as myself and so forth and so on. You begin to feel this greater expansiveness within your state, within your consciousness. Yeah. And so I think, I think that why the word light is an, is important in enlightenment is that that feeling actually gives you a, a sense of lightness. So you don't have that heaviness of, you know, the personality with all of this conditioning and all of the problems and dramas that we have in the world, we have this sense, this feeling of, 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 of lightness, you know, mm. within us. I, I wish I could say I've got that all the time. Right now, I'm just feeling a lot of pressure, <laughs> a lot of dread, a lot, yeah. a lot of crap right now. And I don't, mm. you know, I, I, even with all the interviews I do and I channel myself, you know, in this moment right now, I don't feel so great, yeah? So, so mm -hmm. my point is, you know, we can have all this, and we can talk mm. the way we're talking, and we can, and, and we can, we 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 know of this truth, but the mm. I, I guess what's getting the ego does get in the way a lot, and the ego to myself is just, um, you know, it's 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 this me having a human experience, but not the true me. The true me is my soul, yeah, the the all mm. this essence of I am, or however you want to term it or define that uh, uh, eternal part of yourself that you feel has always been and always will be. But you know, we still wear the the face, the 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 makeup, the the look of of the embodiment of of the identity that we take on, and it's and it's like we don't want to give that up throughout the day, do we? Because it, can it can it can it really make our day better to 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 go completely egoless? Is it possible to even do it? Do you know what I'm trying to get to? I don't know yeah. if I'm saying it very well. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know exactly what you're saying, and, and the thing is. I, I personally don't think that there is um, an, a complete egoless state, for example, like w with what you beautifully explained there, like you have all of these interviews, um, all of these external pressures that, that do pressure the mind and it puts it into a state where you do feel a sense of heaviness. And we all have that, you know, I've, I've sat with masters and that, and they have it too. They get pissed off and, you know, you, you see it as well, you know, so I think the skill is is more so the more you begin to um, how can I say disassociate with the with the ego more often, the more you begin to 
um, in in Sanskrit, there's this term vavika. So vavika is this this idea where you can step back from your egoic state of consciousness and you can perceive actually, you know, the, the workings of the mind, the thoughts, all of the concepts, the stories we tell ourselves. And you can observe that more often in, you know, certain situations during the day. Are you going to be able to hold that all day, 24 hours a day? Probably not. But if you begin to practice that more often, then you'll begin to have more of a non-reactive state of consciousness um, instead of a very reactive emotional state of consciousness, which we usually have of throughout the day. Yeah. And, and, and another thing I wanted to say uh, to elaborate on that is that um, there's a word in uh, in Latin. It's uh, a of eternal. And it's an ancient word. It's um, it does. It's not very used. It's not used much anymore. But it's this. It's it talks about a state of consciousness is where you where you're on the cusp between eternity and also earth life and and they say that the sage lives like on that cusp so they're not completely disappeared and completely egoless they just there's the difference between their state of consciousness and and you and i is they don't have a belief in the identity so they they don't have an invested interest in it um so the problems with us begin the problems with us start when when we have such an invested interest and go into it's hard to blame anyone for that because you know we all have to make a living and and so, and so on and but again it's it's how much are you, are you stuck to that like is it tripping you up in your daily life are you reacting emotionally um to it you know and these are the things that we need to be asking ourselves yes absolutely thank you thank you for that um and maybe there's a part of us that doesn't want to be stripped of our egoness because actually you know can't we meet it halfway where we meet the halfway point between knowing that we are this essence having an experience and yet we are this um uh, we're born into these labels you know kevin moore jason gregory um uh, having this human experience and you know uh, we came here to have this human experience so is there a halfway point is that the way forward to meet it halfway or is that would you have you thought about that yeah, I think that meeting in halfway is, is the perfect way to say it, Kevin, because, you know, I think that when when the ego becomes a burden to you, I mean, if people, what I see in spiritual circles is people think a little bit too much about it. They think, oh, I'm acting out of my ego. I'm doing this and this and that. And it's like a meditative state of consciousness is where you're completely at ease, you know, so you're at ease with even the way you are as, as a person, you know. So this is why other schools of thought, like, for example, Zen Buddhism, they would advocate that there's not even a split, you know, between your 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 true self and, and the ego. That's that's just a, an illusion that we, we make up in our mind because we're, we're basically uh, we're we're basically not happy with the way we are in, in society and and our personality in general. So, for me for me on a personal level, I don't you know I don't really care that much about you know how I how I look to other people I, I know i have my own stupid little idiosyncrasies like anyone else and you know i i learn to you know embrace them and if there are aspects that i can change about myself i will if there are some things that are too hard wide i won't worry too much about it um and i think that this is uh, an approach that people should should take on because you know the in spiritual circles and in people in general these days they I think they just overthink a lot about their their ego and um, the, the eternal aspect of themselves. So I don't see why there isn't any reason why we can be be a human mm. and and still and still have a, a divine experience. And yeah. this is what Durkheim Durkheim he even mentioned uh, homo duplex. So you know he he believes we are he he made up the term homo duplex so on the lower level where we're a human being and when we walk up the staircase that's you know that's where the sacred part of ourself is but mm. we are homo duplex is what he said so we have both of these sides of ourself and it's just about being happy and content you know with that with that state of being yeah you know i've, I've met some some big spiritual teachers in my time and some of them weren't very nice people they were not very nice people, and it, and it shocked me actually to my core because I was like, "Well, hang on, you've done this fantastic work. It changed my life. Some of your material did. 
wow, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> um, I couldn't be that way to someone. Um, no. But what's my point here? I guess my point is, uh, my point is, what is spirituality in some sense then? What is yeah. what does it mean to be spiritual? Because, hi, we we. I don't know really what my question is and why I'm saying these things. I'm just probably venting a little bit on what I see in the market out there. Yeah. What I see. Well, what I was going to say, what I was going to say with what you said, like there was a lecture once Ken Wilber did, and that was a while back, um, 2005 or something like that, and he was mentioning something along the lines of what you were talking about, and he kind of said. Uh, spiritual dickheads you know so this is um where not just teachers but also people who are interested in spirituality build their own belief systems around whatever they've um whatever they're interested in and when they are encountered by people in society which they naturally are that belief system keeps them separate from even listening deeply to someone else or understanding their point of view. You know, putting yourself in someone else's situation is always – that in itself is a spiritual process, a spiritual tendency. And to get back to your point with uh, a lot of gurus and teachers is they just lack that ability to be able to put themselves in that situation. You know, I've sat with – for example, a lot of Advaita Vedanta teachers. Mm, mm. So that's that's non-dualist teachers in mm. India and, and, wow. and around the world. And the problem with a lot of Advaita Vedanta teachers is that the Advaita Vedanta framework sometimes eclipses, you know, what's really needed in that moment. You know, so, sometimes these frameworks of understanding of spirituality cannot answer all, all questions. I've seen, I've seen, for example, a, a woman went up to the guru and she had a lot of problems in her, in her, in her life. And she had, you could see the, the psychological trauma that she was going through. And then the teacher said, you know, who is the one, you know, that, that is, that is, that is seeing this, you know, something they wax lyrical, they use terminology that is part of Advaita Vedanta, but they weren't seeing the problem on, they weren't looking at from, from her level, you know? So a skilled teacher, a skilled spiritual teacher, will always have this tendency they'll be able to speak about the big the big topics but they'll also be able to speak about the mundane topics and this is a this is a highly it's a it's a hard skill to cultivate but um, yeah because some a skillful of the... te- no sorry no go ahead no, no I was just going to say that was just that's just part of what a skillful teacher can do hi guys my name's Kevin Moore and I'm In 2008, a feature-length spiritual documentary called Tuning In was released. It was then the first time six of America's prominent channelers came together on film so viewers could gain insight into the channeling phenomenon. Now, Kevin Moore and his team are going to produce the sequel, Tuning In Now, to help waken people to become their greatest version. We are currently looking to raise $50,000 to make the best channeling documentary possible. And if you feel drawn to contribute, just go to www.tuninginnow.com. Absolutely. And, you know, some of these spiritual teachers, they, they can articulate so well. And um, yeah, I, just can't, I just can't do that. But I think, I think a spiritual teacher nowadays, to a lot of younger generational people, it's probably someone that's just being themselves, probably someone that's transparent. And to, to be transparent nowadays, a lot of people look up to that. People, there's been a shift where transparency matters so much more to people because, you know, we're showing maybe our best selves here. And I'm trying to be transparent in this moment, and I'm sure you are as well. But obviously there's, you know, we live a life and, you know, there are other things that go on in the background as well. Now, I'm not saying we have to, you know, uh, 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 spew our guts to people about, you know, everything. But what I'm saying is I think transparency is the key to being a spiritual teacher nowadays. But then other people will say, no, 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 it's studying for years and becoming one of the great mystics or, or, or studying one of the philosophers that, that you're mentioning there. These are just, yeah. as in my process, what, 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 what I've, you know, come to say is my truth. Oh, for maybe. sure. Yeah, no, and that's 100% right. Kevin, because transparency is very important. 
but I like what you said because it's. I don't think it's an either or thing as well. Like you know, I did mention that. Say for example, I mentioned the Advaita Vedanta, mm. some of the gurus and teachers. Now, the reason why they come across a lot of problems with s- certain people um, is that those people are not familiar with the philosophy and probably are coming from a world that's completely different than, than India. So you're naturally going to have cultural problems. And, you know, there are, there are a few different cognitive styles between East and West, you know, that, that's, that's verified, you know. So we, we have these, these differences um, that I think that we might get lost a little bit too much in um this is why some of the things i like about some schools of eastern thought is that if you've never um read a book or or come across it just on your travels you would have never heard about it and you probably would have never met any of these teachers but then when you meet them the teachers are very good with the the people who actually have gravitated towards them and, and their monastery or whatever it is and you know there's a kind of a yearning to know more but when it becomes for example you know in the uk america and and australia and and canada you know there's a lot of spiritual teachers that don't have they might come from a particular school of thought you know usually eastern thought and then when there's people from you know who are not familiar with their teachings and they come and they ask questions you get in a little bit of this mess because they're not familiar with it and so forth and so on but for their, from their perspective, they definitely need to learn transparency and, you know, being able to listen deeply. And, you know, there's definitely like, for example, if you look at someone like Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, he, he, he has encountered a lot of people in his life that are not even familiar with Zen Buddhism, but he has a way to listen deeply. And though he might not have the English vocabulary to articulate it, you can still feel that there's a genuine compassion and understanding, you know. <laughs> Well, what does a what what does a spiritual life, someone that's coming from an a, an enlightenment now perspective look like compared to someone that's not coming from an enlightenment now perspective? Um, what how does that person? What's different? I mean, I hate to say that we're we we you know to separate people from each other, but there's got to be a positive aspect of being enlightened now compared to a life that's not coming from enlightenment now as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I know. I hate to split as well, but I guess that the, the the state of consciousness of someone who is, you know, who has is fully enlightened, or, or they go through experiences of enlightenment, is more of a a meditative state of consciousness. Now, I don't mean that they're meditating like this. I mean that they they listen deeply, they speak clearly, um, with a lot of intent. Um, they're more passionate about life. They, they seem f- more fully alive than someone, for example, who might watch television and eat Doritos all day. You know, there is different, definitely a, a different state of consciousness going on there. So when you, you've probably been around people like that as well, Kevin, where they, they listen deeply, you feel good around them. You don't mm. know why you can't, mm. you can't pinpoint it, mm. but they listen deeply. They speak with, you know, they're not even, I don't even think they're trying to speak with authority, but the way that they speak has a sense of authority. Mm. And so, and there's also one of the, 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 the glaring characteristics is humility. You know, humility is one of the things that these people have. And I mean a real humility too, not, not something from Charles Dickens, David Copperfield novel, you know, a, a real, a real humility where you listen, you're receptive to what someone has to say. Um, you, you are transparent, you know, you have all of these virtues. And, and I would say that this is what the, the characteristics are, are, are of someone who has kind of marinated in that enlightenment. And, you know, obviously if they're fully present and they're listening to you and they think deeply about things, you know, these things are, are obviously characteristics. You know, we're too much in the culture now of you say, I wait to talk and I say, and it becomes this kind of this, this game of, psychological tennis where we which we play with each other instead of kevin says something to me you know it's not something that i can most of the things we say to we we speak to each other about are things that we can't spontaneously just give an answer to we have to actually think deeply about um, especially if we care for that person and we want to give them you know some some rock solid advice so yeah in a nutshell it is that meditative state of consciousness if that makes any sense to you yep uh, it does. It does. Um, 
And I suppose maybe someone that's coming from enlightenment now is also someone that's maybe found their truth a bit more, maybe, and a bit more happier with their truth. Maybe that's, um, but being happy with truth does not mean that you always embrace it and live it every single moment, and it always comes to test you. Always, always, always. Um, exactly. But exactly. maybe that's because we're always in a form of expansion. And hmm. I, 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 I mean, have you, have you got to a point in life now where everything's just amazing and perfect? <laughs> <laughs> Me personally, no, hmm. not, not. Not, not anywhere near. But I mean, I don't. Uh, you know, for me, I, I know that my life is not perfect, and I go through certain experiences. And I guess that what I try to pride myself on is just being more skillful when these situations happen, because you know they they will inevitably happen. We go through. You know, the universe will throw anything it wants at you. You know, it depends on what you need to to grow psychologically. Mm. So. Mm. You know, um, a lot of people, you know, for example, if, if, if you wanted to reach that state that you were talking about of, you know, complete perfection where everything is kind of, you know, just moving effortlessly in your life, I would say that you might have to become a sadhu or, or a yogi or something like this because that's kind of at the end of, end of striving. So you and I, we're, we're still social creatures. We're still talking on the internet now. So we have to be more skillful with that approach instead of, you know, I'm pretty sure you're not going to drop off the map and, and join, join a group of sadhus in India. You know, um, it, though, you know, you could do that, but. I, I will. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, in a nutshell. Um uh, yeah, no, I could no, no, I don't think I'm here here for that. Um, no. What do we? What does anyone, any of us, know? We're here for. That's a bit of a silly thing to say. We're not here for anything really. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, I think it really comes down to. I think I'm more fulfilled when I'm probably going out there helping people. I'm not saying I would never have a life myself, but I'm saying that being of service is probably an important part. But then you meet a lot of other people, spiritual people channelers metaphysical people who say hang on what about yourself you're here just for you 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 and being here for you is a natural effect of helping others but then others put it that you're here to help others which is a natural effect of helping yourself you know what after all these interviews shit man just do what what, what feels right just, <laughs> just do just do what makes you happy that's what i would say you can't listen to everyone i know there's a lot of people that, that will listen to this show and there's a lot of people that listen to the back catalog stuff i do and all the other types of shows that, that are in the field that i that, that i'm in as well there's so many other hosts that, that are doing some great work as well but um I, th I think we're always searching aren't we but um yeah you <laughs> I think to say something about with what you said, yeah. you know, and, I, and it's a good point is that, you know, a lot, a lot of people these days, especially um, in the West, because, you know, spirituality has become really new and fresh since the 60s, is that people th often tell people what to do and, and how to think and what's right and what's wrong. Kevin, you should be concentrating on yourself, but you feel more, more, more fully alive when you're in service to other people, you know, and this is like, people who have dietary choices where you'll see a vegan kill trying to kill a meat eater and you know the meat eater laughing at the vegan you know you have all of these silly battles and arguments and this comes you know this this can be uh this is a particular cognitive style in the west too because we think things have a logical conclusion we think that anything um has you know, a right and wrong. There's a specific right and wrong. Kevin, you should concentrate on yourself and not worry about other people. And that's not really the way the world is. You know, the universe, look into nature. You know, what's the logical conclusion of a flower or a, or a piece of bamboo? You know, and we kind of divorce ourselves from nature and think that we're just these completely rational creatures, which we do, you know, we do have rationality, but we also are connected to nature, which drives a lot of our intuition. And I, you know, I can do this because we're connected to nature. I don't have to think about this, you know. So, this is why in India they had, I mean, in India especially, they had a lot of problems with this back in the Indus civilization, um, back a few thousand years ago. So they made systems to counteract different constitutions with people. 
So that's why you read in the Bhagavad Gita about the three main constitutions of uh, bhakti, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, and jnana yoga. So bhakti yoga is devotional yoga. Uh, um, karma yoga is um, the yoga of action. And jnana is the yoga of wisdom. So these three kind of, there, there is more yoga. So there's actually seven main branches of yoga. But those three are the main core because, you know, some people are, are actually highly attracted to wisdom and knowledge and studying. Like what you mentioned before, some people like to study and, and practice. That's more of the yani, where a lot of people, are, uh, most people actually uh, fall into the other two categories, bhakti and karma, because, you know, like yourself, you could be, you know, in the old days, a karma yogi, like you're doing a lot of service for people. You're putting out great content interviews and that for people you know, which you have charge, you know what I mean? And, and all of the things that you like to do and help people. So that's, that's more of a karma aspect, but then you have a lot of, uh, bhakti people too, who are, who are really devotional, who have a lot of love for other people They you know, bhakti is kind of a, a, a common trait with a lot of mothers, you know, a lot, a lot of mothers like to really take care of the family and care. And they have this, this undying love for their family and also their friends. So, you know, I, I like these sort of systems of thought because it kind of it, it cuts out the nonsense of that you should be like this and you should be like that. When I think that that's totally a wrong and incorrect way to see the world because, you know, we all can't come to a conclusion on what's right and what's wrong in every single instance. You know, we can on some, but not on every single instance. Mm, no, that's right. You've got to follow what feels right for yourself. Uh, as long yeah. as you're not hurting anybody else or yourself in that process, I'll just add that as well, which I do in that's a lot of interviews, because um, that's not love, uh, being cruel to someone else. Um, no, awesome. no, no. But then again, how much, how, how loving are we to ourselves in any present moment? Um, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Because, you, you, know, you know, you're just trying to get through the day sometimes, aren't you? But maybe we're trying to get to the day from the wrong perspective. Maybe we're so caught up in the way we think it should be, yet we're lost and disconnected from our source in that sense, our true nature of who we are, and what that what 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 would that do in in in, in its in its approach to the day? But we still live in this reality that we're in now, so we can't go in it and, and ignore it, can we? Um, God, these are massive questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, like what you said, like, you know, we wake up every day and we think that we, we have a perspective of the way the day should be. Um, and I, I guess if, if you want to follow that process, you can, you can implement strategies in your day to actually make that happen. You know, you could wake up early, you could meditate, you could uh, exercise after meditation and then eat breakfast and you've already started the day off with a win. You know, so then everything else that follows, whether it's creative work or, or whatever it is you choose to do, should already have the the, the vitality to, to go forward. But at the same time, some days, you know, who is to say the way the day should be? This is kind of, you know, Lao Tzu's perspective in ancient China. You know, he's kind of like he's from the perspective because, you know, Confucius was really big on, you know, the world should be like this and our days should be like this and we should follow rituals and so forth and so on. And Lao Tzu was really skeptical to this because he said, you know, who's to say the way that the world should be? Having to strive to do it, they just naturally do what they do. And, and we can as well if we get out of that, out of that sort of um, addiction to striving. I would say striving is not bad. I would say that we, we're kind of in a, um, a phase um, – in history where we're kind of addicted to striving because, you know, success is apparently at the end of striving, um, wh whether that is financial success or, or expert skill or anything like that. So, you know, I, I again, it's not, a, I don't think it's a either or thing. I think that it's, you know, when you study, especially when you study Chinese philosophers, if you look at Confucius, Lao Tzu, Mencius, uh, Zhuangzi, right? It's four of the big ones. You could look at them. They all speak about similar things, but they have different, different um perspectives and when you look at that and you study that you can apply that to each day of your week and you will see that how that perspective played out in that day you know even though you thought it wasn't going to be like that so you know there's not even though some people do think that there is a certain way um to be and to think um i don't yes. believe that there is a, a fundamental way no 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 it's, um yeah yeah 
Um, yeah, I mean, no, no, none of these are easy questions, and, and, and none of these, I, I think probably you write in this book as well. I mean, I can't imagine it was a completely easy process. To, but, yeah. but no, no, I mean, yeah. um, um, w would you say this is a book of, 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 of your understanding as far as you, as, as, as it has been on your journey, and, and this journey that you've taken has been, up to the point right now, very fulfilling and very... Um, um, Happy. This is. Yeah. Can we use that word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's been. It, it has been extremely fulfilling. So, you know, at times it has been um, stressful. I, I am a writer, so writers don't usually go through a hundred percent blissful experience. Um, there's always the anxiety of editing and so forth and so on, um, and and actually the writing process as well. But I would say that. As for enlightenment now, you know, I I was always fascinated with the phrase uh, tatvamasi. I don't know if you're familiar with tatvamasi. It's a Sanskrit phrase that's found in the Upanishads, and it's basic basically, thou art that. So you are already that now. You don't have to become it. And this is kind of Lao Tzu's, Lao Tzu's perspective as well. You already are innately enlightened, connected to the universe, whatever you want to call it. Um, so from that perspective, you can do whatever you want, really. You know, if you want to strive and be successful, that's okay. But what they would say is always remember that, remember Tatvamasi. So I was always fascinated with that perspective. So I always wanted to write a, a book about that. And so I specifically, you know, that was the target of this book. So mm. I synthesized a lot of Vedanta, Zen Buddhism, Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism, even even perennialism into it and and to get back to your question it synthesizing all of that of course is still from my perspective at that time of my understanding because every author is the same you know it's not any author will explain that even in their writing process from book to book they have new revelations new insights it's, it's like any journey you're any following process. someone's journey aren't you yeah 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 so that's that's the way it is, you know, like I, if I'm like, I'm currently writing a book right now and if it was less than enlightenment now, then I'd be going backwards, but I know it's more and I know that my insights have got bigger Good. and faster and, Good. you know, so, yeah. The question slipped my mind. Hang on. <laughs> it's left me. <laughs> there was something I really wanted to ask you there. Um, okay. Well, well, one of, one of your titles as well in your book is called Fast Food Spiritual Junkie. And that's interesting, actually, because I think when we initially have this enlightenment um, now situation in our life where we've suddenly, you know, our truth is that, oh, well, what if I am more than my body? What if I did come from somewhere? I'm, I'm going back to it. What does that mean in, in, into the present point of attention now, where, where I'm living my life now? Uh, um, am I living the life that I want to live right now from that perspective? Uh, how could I make my life in the moment now better than it than it could have been, knowing that perspective? Um, but I, I suppose we can get uh, quite quite caught up in absorbing so much, can't we? And, and and we can sort of lose ourselves in that moment of becoming awakened as well. Definitely, and that's that's the the drive behind that chapter, actually, Kevin. It's you know a lot of people do you know fall into their own traps or they do fall into their own illusions about even about themselves you know um i've heard people in india for example go to a guru and like i'm i'm enlightened and this and that and it kind of it looks a little bit like um you know something you might see in a christian church uh, a fundamentalist christian church or something like that you know everyone going hallelujah and it's interesting because you know we do our mind does play tricks on us you know we kind of get into these mind games where we think we're more than we are and you know we're actually not you know sometimes the you know in the east especially when when the evidence of someone who's enlightened is usually not someone going around going i'm enlightened you know follow me i should be like this you'll actually find hermits in the mountains in china and that they're just humble men you know they're humble men they make their rice porridge every morning they go out and they farm and next minute someone might walk past their home, you know, in the mountains and they start to talk to them and they realize, wow, this guy's, you know, he's not promoting himself. He's just, he 
he has a lot of deep insights about reality and about the nature of of humans and so you know that's why you know when i when i mentioned fast food spiritual junkie is that you don't want to start going around calling yourself enlightened or this and that you know i even have a kind of a nervous reaction about calling myself a teacher or something like that you know involved in this field even though it's it's pure semantics but you know there's a a couple of particular traits with with people in the modern day, you know, um, are especially with people who follow, like what you said, non-dualist philosophy. So you know, I'm not this body. I know eventually when I die, I'll I will transcend or and go to the to God or the next reality or what or what have you. Um, a lot of people begin to use these philosophies. Which are which are which are frameworks for our mind to become more peaceful and more humble. We need to remember, but a lot of them use use it to actually suppress psychological pain and things that we we avoid in ourselves. So this is this this term this has actually been termed by uh, American psychologist John Wellwood back in the eighties, spiritual bypassing. So you know, spiritual bypassing <clears throat> is a, is a key. I think it's a key in, in, in anyone's spiritual growth because, you know, it's a psychological term, but it gets to that point where you can't – spirituality is great. You know, if you want to get involved in anything, like you said, channel, channeling or, or Buddhism or, or what have you, you know, it doesn't matter. If you're using that as a crutch to suppress certain things that you've avoided within your psychology, then this is probably um, not a good idea. And you see this happen – you know, when we were speaking about uh, gurus and teachers before, Kevin, sometimes when you see people react the way they react, it's because they've used whatever spiritual or philosophical system that, you know, they haven't that framework in their mind, but it's suppressed a lot of things. So when you kind of push their button just a little bit, you know, the their emotional reaction, their deep subconscious um, content begins to come out and you know, one of the keys in, in any spiritual process is to try and um, uh, release a lot of that subconscious content that we have, you know, from from birth, maybe even past lives, maybe, um, to, to get rid of some of that. So, Hi, guys. My name's Kevin Moore, and I'm the host of The Moore Show. Now, it's my purpose, my passion, my mission to help you guys become your greatest version. Now you might be looking to find answers on love, connecting with your life's purpose, reuniting with a loved one on the other side, discovering your past lives, or just helping you make sense in finding your direction. Now as a multi-dimensional channel, I can connect with higher aspects of yourself to help you in this present moment to become your best version and live your most empowered life. Now you can book myself for a reading by going to TMS site. In 2008, a feature-length spiritual documentary called Tuning In was released. It was then the first time six of America's prominent channelers came together on film so viewers could gain insight into the channeling phenomenon. Now Kevin Moore and his team are going to produce the sequel, Tuning In Now, to help waken people to become their greatest version. We are currently looking to raise $50,000 to make the best channeling documentary possible. And if you feel drawn to contribute, just go to www.tuninginnow.com. The reason they're, they're like they are, maybe, is because, yeah, you know, it, source, the universe will speak through anyone <laughs> if they're open, yeah. which we are all always open, but it's a choice whether we listen or not. Um, uh, no matter who, what temperament they've got or whatever. Um, but if they've not dealt with some issues, then yeah, it will be like that, won't it? Mm. It definitely will. And this is why in certain systems in, in India, for example, classical yoga, um, and I mean classical yoga, I'm not talking about Hatha yoga where people stretch, that's only one part of yoga, but the actual philosophical system is actually a, a, a framework for our mind where you have these these levels of karma, vasanas, and samskaras. And so karma is karma literally means action, and vasanas mean uh, our latent habits and tendencies, and samskaras is like the subliminal imprints that we have. And a lot of them we get 
before we actually even become conscious. So, you know, when we're children, we, we take on so much that you have this deep um, sub, subconscious, these mental impressions that are wound up in the matrix of your psychosomatic organism. And so the process in, in uh, classical yoga, which I call actually uh, Eastern psychology, is basically trying to dig down into those. And you do that the reverse way. So but a lot of our karma is driven by our samskaras and our vasana. So we act uh, unconsciously a lot of the time emotionally. So when you begin to train yourself not to do that, you begin to dig into your habits and your tendencies. And then when you begin to observe your habits and your tendencies, then you begin to dig into the, the hard wire within mm. yourself. But that's not an easy that's not an easy process by no means, but um, that's one that um, you need to be very astute with every day. So, um, but that, we all go through our time. We yeah, all go through our time. Yeah, I think my biggest thing, which probably maybe some of my audience can relate to as well, is I think my, some of my biggest upset is is down to um, money. Hmm. It's down to not being financially abundant, or I should say to myself, I am financially abundant. I am. Everything financially abundant is around me in this very moment. Of course, I'm just kidding myself by saying that, but I know that by saying that, you know, you attract to you as you are a frequency vibration, the vibration of that, which is what you're looking for. Um, that's been my biggest pain, my biggest point of sadness, my biggest uh, issue so far and I think to myself okay so you've got a million pound in the bank right not a million but say you've got you know <laughs> ten thousand ten thousand dollars ten thousand pound in the bank would you be any is it would your would your happiness be there then and um I think with everything I've got with that on top I think it would be <laughs> but um right now I don't know it's just a struggle and I'm, and I'm fed up with that side of struggling, really fed up. And it almost makes me want to just pack everything that I'm doing. But then I think, now there's nothing else of what I'd want to do but this. But there's, you know, making financial abundance from what we do, from being enlightened now, that, that's a, 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 a part of this as well, I really do believe. Of course, of course. And, you know, um, it's sometimes it's it's good to, sometimes it's good to be realistic about you know the way things are as well because that might give you the the motivation to actually you know you know be financially abundant and again money is an interesting thing you know some people who become financially abundant uh, do become unhappy because they don't know how to use the money properly someone like yourself Kevin you might know how to use the money properly and 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 benefit yourself and other people you know so this again comes back back to how conscious we are and 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 more aware of what we're doing in our life you know i've heard stories of someone who has won the lottery in america 300 million they lost it all and i don't know how anyone can lose 300 million dollars but it's obviously possible you know um so i think that you know if you know how to spend the money i think that that that's a great a great thing um, if you can become financially abundant, but if but if somebody doesn't know how to do it, and it, it, it can lead to destructive tendencies, you know, there's there's no doubt about that. So, well, my, I suppose my point is, you you, you know, you 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 can, uh, well, I was going to say that yeah, you you may know how to spend the money to, to be of service to others, but does the universe even care about that? Does it care? Does it give two shits about that? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it not really about that? I suppose, I suppose maybe my point is, you know, why do, what, what, where, it almost feels unfair sometimes, doesn't it? Like where you live in an unfair universe that um, you can't have it all. Um, or maybe you can, I don't know. I don't know, or maybe it's a sign of not actually living in purpose by not actually being abundant like you want to be. Actually, you're not living your purpose. Your purpose is actually something else, and all those signs around you of the pain you're going through, of the not being abundant, it's just actually something that you're not in. You know, you're not in alignment with what what you sh what you could be doing. I don't know. Maybe that's not even true. Maybe I'll look, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll look back on this interview and think, well, why did I say that for? I don't know. <laughs> well, I th I think that the, yeah, the questions. You know the the questions that you're asking are, are very um, universal and they're difficult to for any of us to answer, I guess. And 
you know, you, like you said before, you know, sometimes it doesn't seem fair. Like, for example, someone might not be the best person, but they have abundance and they, they appear happy, you know, and then you've got other people who have nothing. Um, and they, and they're good people, but they don't have anything. And, and, and that's a prevailing theme throughout the world, you know, but I think one of the big problems in the world is we are, um, to use a psychological term, we are primed for money a lot, you know, so we, we go through a lot of psychological priming for money. So it's everywhere, advertising, everything. And so when we, when we look at money, money itself is just an energy, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's an energy, I would, I'm not going to say similar to love, but, you know, imagine if our world, the currency was focusing on love itself and pure love, you know what I mean? Not just love for your, 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 your family and friends, but pure love for, for humanity and, and for each other. Um, and if we focus more on that, but we're not primed for that, you know, we're not psychologically primed. We're primed for money. You know, Kevin's got to go out and make money. Jason's got to make money. He's got to write a a thousand books to make ends meet, mm. you know, and all mm. of the, and all of these things. So, um, I think it's important to be conscious of the priming that we go through in our society because it, it's real, you know, uh, everything. I mean, you cannot go through a news bulletin, for example, and not hear the word money and troubles with money, the budget, how someone's broke, how someone's abundant. It's constant. And, you know, how come we don't have news bulletins talk, speaking about, wow, this guy's compassion was overwhelming or their forgiveness in this moment was very powerful, but we don't have, you know, that's not, I mean, that doesn't, the, new, the news networks know that's not going to, you know, get the ratings. Mm. So they mm. focus, focus on money. Well, okay. If, if someone's, my final kind of question, if someone's um, watching this now and they've, they've going through enlightenment, or maybe they've gone through enlightenment. I don't know if you've ever gone through it. You I think it's sort of continuous, right? But, um, and they're not in a happy space. What what what's what some of the things they can do? Okay, if they if they haven't gone through uh, if they haven't uh, recognized enlightenment and they're in an unhappy place, that's a good question. Uh, or or maybe they've recognized maybe they've gone through enlightenment. Maybe they feel that that they've gone through enlightenment. Yeah, and they've and they're back into mm. an unhappy place. Mm. Well, I'd say there's a – you'd have to reevaluate evaluate your life, I think, that there must be certain things in your life that are that are making you unhappy. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we don't need to be too harsh on ourselves. Not Sometimes it's not just us that, that makes us unhappy. I mean, there are certain externals that can make us unhappy and there are certain habits that we have that are, that are us that make us unhappy. So, for example – if you've had an experience of enlightenment and then you've gone back into a state of, you know, psychological dramas in yeah. your mind and, and so forth and so on, I would say that there has to be a need to go back to um, evaluating your life and, and making, maybe even implementing some discipline in your life. You know, certain things like if you, if you are struggling, for example, sometimes simple things like exercising more, meditating more, or just eating more healthy food will will change your your mood and your state of your state of being you know this does turn on certain chemicals in our mind that makes our mind naturally more harmonious and and just in, in a better state more positive you know a lot of people who are who go back into negativity and go back into an unhappy state are usually just people who are self-loathing you know they are they don't exercise they watch they fill their mind up with too much stuff this is a big thing. What's going on through here? And this is this is one part of how we transform energy. We transform energy through our eyes and our ears. You know, eating is another one, and and and, and breathing is another one. There are three ways. But if a lot of the time, what's going on through here is is a big thing why we're unhappy. So I would say that if you if you have gone back into a state of unhappiness, be more conscious of what you're putting in through here. Mm. You know. Mm. And Confucius used to talk about this too. This is why he used to focus. He used to go down to the to the nth degree. He would, he would talk about the music you listen to, the conversations you engage in, and so forth and so on. But I would say, you know, I, I see a lot of people, you know, I don't have a, a phone personally, but I see a lot of people who are always engaged on the news, on the Facebook feeds, on the Twitter feeds. And this is this is toxic. This is making your mind agitated. You're, 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 
your mind is just being overstimulated. You're, you're overstimulating your sympathetic nervous system without accessing your parasympathetic nervous system, um, which is actually rest and relaxation. So the more you do this, the more crazy you're going to be in your mind. Your, your mind is going to be like this, and you're not going to be able to focus on conversations. Um, you're definitely not going to be able to meditate deeply. You're definitely not going to be able to listen deeply to people because your mind's going to be agitated from what happened or what someone said on or what commented on your Facebook post or so forth and so on. So I would say to someone, take charge of your life a little bit in that sense. You know what I mean? Start to reclaim your power a bit. Um, focus on I, – I always say the four fundamentals. So the four fundamentals is – um, meditation, healthy diet, exercise, and adequate rest. You know, sleeping is something we overlook in, in, in this world. You know, I, I've been practicing for a while going to bed at 9 p.m. A lot of people think I'm a grandma. But I'm going to bed at 9 p.m. and I'm waking up at 5.30 or 6 in the morning and then I meditate. But I feel like fully alive instead of go- when I used to – when I when I usually, I used to go to bed at like midnight or one or, you know, and then, it, and you wake up still at seven and that, and you, you just, you're depleted. Your, your energy is all out of whack. And so I think if you transform these four fundamentals, this is, this is, can be the stepping stone to, to getting back into, into a more enlightened state. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's really important there. Yeah, sleep is important. And you mentioned you've got no phone as well. Wow. You've got no smartphone. <laughs> oh my gosh. No. Well, that's kind of, well, that's an inspiration <laughs> to other people because I think you're right. There's a lot of that going on where you're just, compl- even at the dinner table or whatever, you're just sucked into, you know, what's, what's going on in your news feed. And I think, um, I think it's such an important thing you said there. Everything you said is really good, but that, that was, that, that was uh, you know, and what, what you're putting into your, 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 your senses as well um, is, is so important. What, what would you say then is, is a really, well, you probably said it, but just to ask you again, what would you say is the most important message of your book? The most important message of my book is similar to the, the subtitle, Liberation is Your True Nature. So, you know, I, I see a lot of, uh, I think, unwanted suffering in the world. Um, I, I don't mean physical suffering, although I mean psychological suffering. I mean people suffering internally. And I think that they forget, you know, you know, and this may seem cliche, but they forget a lot of the simple things in their lives. You know what I mean? The friends they have, the families they have, the relationships they have, you know, the maybe the little money they have too, you know, but that can also be seen as good. So I think that you know, when we start to look at those simple things and we start to realize that, you know, we don't have to really become um, like a, a superman or a, or a super successful person in life, then we start to relax. We start to be relaxed on ourselves. And, and paradoxically, you might become successful. Who knows? But usually you don't get there with being tense and agitated. And, you know, people don't really like, in general, don't like to be around someone who's tense and agitated because they usually have you know, a bad attitude. But fundamentally, the, the, the main theme of my book is that we already have that enlightenment within us. We are already enlightened at, at our core. It's innate. Um, but the, the drama that we have is how to resonate more with that than with, the, with, with how we suffer. So I guess that's the key point. Um, you know, it's like the, the story of, of Gautama the Buddha, you know. He realized himself that he had been suffering for enlightenment and it was only until he, he stopped striving that he, that he started to understand his own suffering. So that's kind of a metaphor for our own lives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, look, um, just thank you so, so much uh, for coming on today. I've really appreciated uh, having you on and sharing your truth as well. And I'd just like to say, Jason, um, until next time, the next book, uh, I look forward to getting you back on and uh, just keep uh, doing what you're doing as well. Thank you. Kevin, thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. 
Well, we've come to an end on today's show. Don't forget that you can listen and watch all our past interviews on the More Shows official YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new daily shows. You may also find out more on our past and upcoming guests by going to themoreshow.com and do like us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates. So until next time, be safe. Hi guys, my name's Kevin Moore and I'm the host of The Moore Show. Now it's my purpose, my passion, my mission to help you guys become your greatest version. Now you might be looking to find answers on love, connecting with your life's purpose, reuniting with a loved one on the other side, discovering your past lives or just helping you make sense in finding your direction. Now, as a multi-dimensional channel, I can connect with higher aspects of yourself to help you in this present moment to become your best version and live your most empowered life. Now, you can book myself for a reading by going to TMS. Established over 100 years ago, Watkins Books is one of the world's oldest and leading independent bookshops specializing in esoterica. We have the widest selection of esoteric books in the UK and our friendly and knowledgeable staff are here to assist you in a unique ambience of our shop. So come and visit us in the heart of London as we're open every day.